I'm going to do something tonight that I never do. So, so bear with me as, as I do this. Um, let me explain to you first why I started studying and then writing on the Nation of Islam. When I was a seminary student, there were two events that, that really caused me to think very pointedly about the relationships between Christians of various ethnicities. It was one thing to see events in the culture at large that made me question whether or not uh, there were certain uh, ethnic tensions, so to speak. Um, some would say racial tensions. I don't say that um, because there's only one race. Uh, the idea that there are multiple races is not a biblical idea. There is but one race. There are multiple ethnicities. But there is one race, all derived from the one man, Adam. You could possibly argue that there are two races, the race of the first Adam and the race of the last Adam, who are redeemed. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there, there, there are no racial distinctions between human beings as far as biblical Christianity is concerned. But there's much ethnic strife, and one would assume that within the body of Christ you wouldn't see that especially among seminarians, two things happened. One was the Rodney King trial. And, and I remember, you know, that there, are a lot of, there were a lot of cameras in a lot of places on that day. And the news when uh, the, the verdict uh, came down, um, excuse me, not the Rodney King trial, but the OJ trial, two things, Rodney King and OJ put together. News cameras when verdicts came down, and the distinction between the response of black people and white people on both of those things was just amazing. For one of those, I was in the sort of common area, and I watched, I watched a group of seminarians have the exact same ethnic divergence in their response on verdict day that the rest of the culture at large did. White seminarians largely responding one way and black seminarians largely responding another. And I filed that away. Another event happened in 1995, and that was the Million Man March. Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam, called for a Million Man March. And a lot of people remember Million Man March, and that sounds familiar, the idea of Million Man March. It was on October the 16th. Um, so two days ago was the 18th anniversary of the Million Man March. But the Nation of Islam is not celebrating the anniversary of the, quote, Million Man March. They're celebrating the anniversary of a holy day of atonement because that's what the Million Man March was called a day of atonement for black men. Why was this significant for me during that period of my life? Louis Farrakhan, the head of the Nation of Islam, came to Houston, and he had a press conference in Houston leading up to the Million Man March. There were half a dozen or so black pastors in the Houston area who were standing shoulder to shoulder with Louis Farrakhan promoting the Million Man March. Now remember, the Million Man March was a day of atonement. Among this half a dozen black pastors who were standing with Louis Farrakhan, two of them I was in seminary with at the time. And one was the moderator of the then Union Baptist Association in the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, I have some knowledge of the Nation of Islam, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted. This is a problem. Number one, I was bothered by the fact that these men were standing shoulder to shoulder with Louis Farrakhan, promoting an event that Farrakhan was calling a Day of Atonement, just straight blasphemy to the blood of Christ. And the second thing that really struck me were that my, my, my brothers in seminary of other ethnicities 
were confused. And on the one hand, they were disturbed because they said, why would these guys be standing with and uniting with Muslims on something called the Day of Atonement? But on the other hand, they immediately had that white guilt reaction that says, it's a black thing I must not understand. So the response was to not engage. Well, that sort of started me on a journey and on a quest to bring to light more information about the nation of Islam, thinking, naive as I was, that if you just let people know what we're dealing with, then maybe we can make some headway in some of these issues. So that resulted in me turning my doctoral thesis in the direction of the Nation of Islam. The title of my doctoral thesis was A Critical Analysis of the History and Theology of the Nation of Islam with a View Toward an Effective Christian Response. It's boring. (laughs) But since then, I've written a number of articles about it and more bite-sized pieces for other publications. Um, And and one of those I want to share with you tonight. I wrestled with how um, best to present this. I I don't want you to think that I'm mocking the nation of Islam. So there are a lot of quotes directly from nation of Islam sources in this. Because if I were to just tell you these are the things that these people believe, you would think that I was mocking the nation of Islam. But I want you to keep this in mind. I want you to keep in mind that picture of half a dozen black pastors in Houston, Texas, standing shoulder to shoulder with Louis Farrakhan and other representatives of the Nation of Islam because they fought the Million Man March going to Washington for a national day of atonement for black men was a good idea for them and for their churches. And many of their brethren of other ethnicities Most, the overwhelming majority, almost nobody took it upon themselves to challenge them on it because of this fear that we have. And it was was wrong on both instances. So, here we go. The Nation of Islam is often characterized as a black Muslim sect. However, a closer look reveals that the movement is best classified as a quasi-Islamic black nationalist cult. Uh, These these folks aren't Muslims at all. That's the great irony. You'll understand that more. The movement was established in Detroit around 1930 with the appearance of an enigmatic silk peddler named Wallace Fard. That name is incredibly important. You may have heard of Fard Muhammad or Farad Muhammad Um, That's the individual Wallace Fard. He blended uh, allegorical interpretations of biblical texts, popular black nationalist rhetoric, strict legalistic morality, and Jehovah's Witness teaching to form the basis of what would become the nation of Islam. Um, You notice what's not present there? There's allegorical interpretation of biblical passages. And here's what you'll notice with the Nation of Islam and with Louis Farrakhan. If you hear Louis Farrakhan speak, he's almost always quoting the Bible, not the Quran. So there's these allegorical interpretations of biblical passages, popular black nationalist rhetoric. There were a lot of different black nationalist groups at the time. There was a big back to Africa movement. There were Um, other, you know, black nationalist organizations uh, at the time. So he blended some of their teachings, the black Moors and so on and so forth. Strict legalistic morality and Jehovah's Witness teaching. What's missing there is the Quran. What's missing there is Islamic teaching. The theological distinctives. The Nation of Islam claims to be an Islamic movement. However, much of their theology undermines that claim. And due to the vast nature of this topic, the scope of this presentation is limited to the movement's doctrine of God, revelation, cosmology, anthropology, soteriology, and eschatology in a very limited sense. The reason for this delineation is threefold. One, 
These categories comprise much of the basis for Islamic theology. Second, these are areas where Christianity and Islam can be compared and contrasted with the nation of Islam. So you can see the difference between them and Christians and between them and Muslims. And third, uh, due to the reactionary nature of the movement, the nation of Islam doesn't have a, a well-documented theology apart from these categories. It's not even well-documented in these categories. So let's look at them. First, the nature of God. And so it begins. Nature of Islam teaches that, quote, God is a man, and we just cannot make him other than a man, lest we make him an inferior one. For man's intelligence has no equal in other than man, end quote. Elijah Muhammad also argued that, quote, if he were a spirit and not a man, we would all be spirits and not human beings. Do you follow this? God has to be a man just like you and me. Not that the second person in the Trinity took on a human nature, as we would say. No, 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 no such thing. But that God is actually a man just like you and me. He attributes all the qualities of a man, including marriage, sex, frailties, weaknesses, and mistakes. All of those are attributed to God. So when the nation of Islam says Allah, they do not mean the same thing that Sunnis or Shiite or other, they do not mean the same thing that Muslims mean when they say Allah. More specifically, NOI theology teaches that God is a black man, that he, the black man, created himself out of the blackness of space, took the color from the darkness from which he emerged. All that exists in the universe, according to this teaching, was created by black intellect. There's the other idea. Again, which is why it, it, this was so shocking to me. When you understand the nature of this movement and their understanding that the black man is divine. Um, by the way, the other shoe drops. Uh, the white man is demonic. Uh, because blackness in its purity represents pure deity. The further away you get from blackness, the closer you get to pure evil. So that white people are pure evil and black people are pure deity. Remember, six black pastors in Houston standing shoulder to shoulder with this movement for a day of atonement. How about the person of God? The fulcrum point in NOI theology is the belief that Allah revealed himself in the person of Wallace Fard, in 1930. Remember, I told you that name was going to be important. Not just a guy, this was God. So when they say Allah, they're referring to this particular man, Wallace Fard. In Message to the Black Man in America, um, and this is Elijah Muhammad's sort of magnum opus, if you will, he states, I teach not the coming of God, but the presence of God in person. He continues, quote, Allah came to us from the holy city Mecca, Arabia, in 1930, he used the name Wallace D. Fard. He came alone. Today, if you get the newspaper that the Nation of Islam sells, in the back of it they have sections, what the Muslims want and what the Muslims believe. And they still state that Allah was the person, Wallace Fard. That Wallace Fard in 1930 was Allah. That was God. Again, these people are not talking about the same thing that Muslims are talking about. There's also the idea of the plurality of God. God's not the only God in Nation of Islam teaching. In fact, at the core of the Nation of Islam doctrine of God is the idea that while there is only one God at a time, no God lives forever. Hence, there must be a succession of supreme gods throughout the course of history. This is said to happen once every 25,000 years. They believe in these cycles of the earth, 25,000 years. The supreme god is the ruler of a divine council of 24 black scientists 
who govern the affairs of the world during each successive cycle. That council of 24 black scientists is going to be very important later on. Now, a critique of this, um, one of the things that, that they teach, if you remember the idea of blackness is divine, the further away you get from blackness, you get toward pure evil. Well, one of these 24 scientists was a, 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 a scientist by the name of Jakob. And Jakob went to perform some experiments on the island of Patmos. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The island of Patmos, okay. So Jakob is, is, is performing these experiments on the island of Patmos. And it's these, experience, these experiments that he's performing that actually creates the white race. And the further he got away from blackness, the more evil these products of his experiment became until he created the white man, which is the devil himself, okay? So that white people are demonic. Now, the Nation of Islam calls this practice grafting. And they say in no uncertain terms that the grafting process cannot be reversed. So once you move away from pure blackness and you get to individuals who are white, you get to someone who is purely demonic and you can't go back from there. Why is this so significant? Well, remember they say Wallace Fard was God, that he was Allah? Um, first of all, obviously there's no evidence to support his deity. Secondly, there's his flawed humanity. Um, for instance, uh, he was a bootlegger. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, he was sexually promiscuous. He abandoned his family, so on and so forth. Not very godlike uh, behavior. But he was also white. If you've ever seen um, Louis Farrakhan at an official Nation of Islam event, if you've ever seen one of his speeches in one of their halls, um, there, there's a couple of days that are very important. One is that day in October, this, this holy day of atonement commemorating uh, the Me and Man March. Another one is Savior's Day. It's at the end of Fe February, Savior's Day. And there is often a big to-do and a big speech that Farrakhan makes in February for Savior's Day. And behind him, there's always a picture there's a picture of a guy who's not a black guy, not at all, not close to a black guy, not even kind of a black guy. It's a picture of Wallace Fard. This is the guy they say was Allah. But by their own definition, he would be a demon. Not only that, Elijah Muhammad, first main leader of the Nation of Islam, who came after, he's the main disciple of Wallace Fard. He was bi-ethnic, which means at least half demonic. Malcolm X, who became the most prominent teacher in the Nation of Islam before he converted to Islam. He was bi-ethnic which means he was demonic. Louis Farrakhan, the current leader of the Nation of Islam, is, you guessed it, bi-ethnic, which means by their own theology, these men are demons. And remember, the grafting process can't be reversed. There's also the idea of polytheism in the Nation of Islam. The idea of these 24 scientists. Again, island of Patmos, the number 24, um, these things are coming from Revelation. There's also the idea of pantheism in the nation of Islam. Louis Farrakhan, in his book, A Torchlight for America, uses terminology reminiscent of the New Age movement in attributing deity to all mankind, in particular to black people. In one instance, he states, one of the things that separates man from the beast is knowledge. Knowledge feeds the development of human being so that the person can grow and develop into the divine and become one with the creator. 
here he gets to the idea that what keeps the black man from asserting his deity is a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge. He has to come to the knowledge of who he is so that his deity is sort of activated, if you will. For them, as we'll see, that is salvation. What about their doctrine of revelation? How do we know God? Well, like most cults, they have a Gnostic hermeneutic. Nation of Islam believes that the knowledge of God was withheld from the world until the coming of Wallace Fard. Elijah Muhammad taught, quote, this is the first time that the true knowledge of God has ever been revealed. And we, the poor, rejected, and despised black American people are blessed to be the first of all the people of earth to receive this secret knowledge of God. Now, that's the very definition of Gnosticism. There's a secret knowledge of God that was never revealed, and guess what? We are the first ones in the history of the world to get this secret knowledge of God. More specifically, Nation of Islam argues that, that white people are incapable of understanding either the Bible or the Quran, and that only those blacks that have experienced mental resurrection can attain this true knowledge. This approach is fortified by a claim that both the Bible and the Quran have been tampered with and are thus not trustworthy. No Muslim would make this claim. So here we go. We have a secret knowledge of God that was withheld from the rest of the world until Wallace Fard came. This is Elijah Muhammad who just happens to be Fard's disciple and now his disciple who's currently there today. In order to understand this secret revealed knowledge, you can't get it from the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is not trustworthy. Why? Because white people touched it. You can't get it from the Quran. Why? Because Quran is not trustworthy. Why? Because white people touched it. So where do you get it? You can only get it from a black person who has been enlightened, received the knowledge from and of the nation of Islam. Well, I don't believe you. Well, that's because you're trusting in tainted documents and you haven't accepted what it is that we teach. Do you see the circular reasoning there? Alleged corruption of the Bible and the Quran. The black nation is said to be the author of both the Quran and the Bible. However, like all evil, the corruption of the holy books is attributed to the white race. The enemy has tampered with the truth in both books, for he has, per, he has been permitted to handle both books. The NOI teaches that the Bible was changed in order to make slaves docile. This is a very popular argument. Um, for example, the Nation of Islam is the fastest growing religion among black men, especially in prison. Um, the idea is that you know what you think is a result of you being programmed. The white man has programmed you. He's taught you things that were designed to docilize slaves. All that stuff about turning the other cheek, that was just so the slaves wouldn't rebel. Um, you know, Christianity is slave religion. You need to get away from that slave religion. How do you know it is? Well, because white people taught it to you. And you can't trust them. Now we go back to the idea of Jacob and the 24 scientists. Hence, the Nation of Islam doctrine of revelation does not account for the uh, preservation of the essential documents of its faith. Thus, followers are relegated to dependence upon their enlightened leaders for instruction in all matters. This teaching has two main consequences. First, the movement is forced into an apostolic hierarchy. You have to have an apostolic hierarchy. You, you, you got nothing. How do you get truth? You can't read your Bible and get truth. You can't read Quran and get truth. You can only get it from your enlightened teachers. And you can only get your enlightened teachers through the apostolic hierarchy. Second, there's a need for either a restored text or a replacement text, which conveniently is something that has been promised. 
The NOI argues, we are to change the two worlds, meaning Christianity and Islam, then surely we need a new book. Elijah Muhammad went on to promise, there is another book that none has been able to see or read, its contents coming soon from Allah, the last book. So they're waiting for, they were waiting for a last book. Again, the critique, number one, circular reasoning. But here's number two. They're constantly using and referring to flawed texts. You listen to them and they're quoting the Bible. What's the Bible? It's a flawed text. You can't trust it. On occasion, they'll quote from the Quran. Well, what's the Quran? The Quran is a flawed text. You can't trust it. But you can trust me. So whatever I say about these texts, you know that that's the truth. What about their cosmology? I, I won't um, spend much time on this. But the Nation of Islam cosmology, what they believe about the created world, is a mixture of science fiction and the misinterpretation of key texts in the Bible and the Quran. Uh, first, the movement offers a fascinating account of creation. Quote, in the beginning, there was blackness, a triple blackness of space, water, and divinity. The one supreme God came into existence at the origin of the universe 76 trillion years ago. He willed himself into being in the form of a black man cell by cell in a process that took six trillion years. The first supreme one was a warrior who, in order to combat darkness and shed light, created the sun, which represents freedom and creativity, out of his fire, which is truth. He imbued the planets with life and had them submit to the sun and called it the solar system. The story includes life on other planets, an explosion that separated the earth and the moon, and ex not just any kind of, this was an explosion of, action, of TNT. It was an explosion of TNT. It wasn't even a nuclear explosion. An explosion of TNT that separated the earth and the moon. The God of the world at that time was actually trying to destroy the world because of evil, obviously, of the white race, but he failed in destroying the world, and instead the explosion just separated a part of the earth off that became the moon. What about their anthropology? They believe about man. The world, according to NOI anthropology, is divided into two segments, one black and one white. And by the way, when they say one black and one white, um, everybody who's not white falls into the black category. Um, for example, a lot of these individuals uh, were, were arrested uh, during the Second World War because they would not register with selective service. Um, two reasons for this. One, they refused to fight against dark-skinned people on behalf of white people. Secondly, they believed that they were actually citizens of Mecca, and they would change their names. They would either take, you know, the, you know, the X. A lot of people would become so-and-so X, um, but they would change their names, arguing that the other names that they had were slave names. Um, and they would take the X until they came up with some Islamic word that they would, you know, then identify themselves with. So when they say black world, white world, it's not that they don't recognize other ethnicities. It's just that if you're, if you're not white, you're, you're almost one of them, one of us. The black man is divine while the white man is demonic. Again, a black scientist named Jakob created these white men in a process that happened 6,600 years ago. When he did it, he also gave a decree. The decree was that the white man would rule for 6,000 years, but then his end would come. Let me move ahead.
their doctrine of salvation. Many argue that the nation of Islam has no soteriology, that they don't have a doctrine of salvation because they don't believe in an afterlife. See, Eric Lincoln explains, in their day-to-day living, the black Muslims are governed by a stringent code of private and social morality. Since they do not look forward to an afterlife, this morality is not related to any doctrine of salvation, end quote. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which the nation of Islam teaches salvation. You have to understand that one of the goals in the nation of Islam was actually to win black Christians away from Christianity. You got to keep this in mind. That, that was one of the goals. That's why they teach so much from the Bible. They target churches. Um, they target black Christians. And what they try to do is undermine a faith in biblical Christianity. You can't trust that book. That book was made to docilize slaves. That book is all about slave religion, so on and so forth. So their theology is like a parallel to Christian theology. They call it Islamic theology mainly because that sounds exotic. But as you've already heard, there's almost nothing about it that's Islamic. Nothing. And so because of that, they do talk about salvation. Just a different version and a different idea. They try to tell Christians this is not about pie in the sky. Not about the great by and by. It's about here. It's about now. Don't you want yours now? Salvation in the nation of Islam is tied to the here and now. Without a belief in the resurrection, their teaching is centered on the mental resurrection of the black race. This mental resurrection leads the black man to Islam, his true and original religion. The specific practices required include prayer, fasting, and the avoidance of the traditional black diet. It's interesting. If you look at the things that Muslims avoid, it, it, it doesn't look like a list that you would find from Judaism or a list that you would find from Islam. It looks like something that you find at a soul food restaurant. You know, why soteriology is summed up in Elijah Muhammad's statement. Quote, regardless of our sins that we have committed in following and obeying our slave masters, Allah forgives it all today if we, the so-called Negroes, will turn to him and our own kind. That sounds like something from the KKK. Allah promises salvation if we'll turn to him and those like us. Turn away from people who are not like us. Again, I want you to remember this picture of six black pastors in Houston in 1995 standing shoulder to shoulder with this to go to Washington for a day of atonement. First, Salvation in the, in the nation of Islam is for the black man only. As noted earlier, they view the black man as divine and the white man as demonic. White people can't be saved. Second, the sins of the black man, if you notice in the statement, are directly related to his contact with white men. Finally, salvation is tied to nationalism. One of the things that the black nationalists, that the nation of Islam, argue is that black people should be given a state in America. Pick one. Just give us a state. It's got to be a good-sized state. And give us all the resources of that state so that we can have our own nation. By the way, you have to support us for the first 25 years. That's their idea of separation. We want our people in America whose parents and grandparents were descendants from slaves to be allowed to establish a separate state or territory of their own, either on this continent or elsewhere. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to provide such land and that the area must be fertile and minerally rich 
We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to maintain and supply our needs in this separate territory for the next 20 to 25 years until we are able to produce and supply our own needs. Again, racism and separatism. What about their eschatology? Where's it all going? What are we looking forward to? Well, number one, the imminent destruction of the white devils. The central theme of the Nation of Islam's eschatology is the destruction of the white race. In the seminal teaching on this matter, Elijah Muhammad states, quote, they were created to rule us for 6,000 years, and then Allah will destroy them from the earth and give the earth back to its original owners, the black nation. In fact, this, according to NOI teaching, was the primary reason for the coming of Allah. What about the mother planet? and the destruction of the world. This is where it gets a little fantastic, as though it hasn't already. One of the most astounding beliefs in the Nation of Islam theology is, that the, uh, is the idea of the mother plane. Uh, this man-made UFO, which spans one half mile, exists for the purpose of destroying the white race in the Battle of Armageddon. Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad described the plane. Listen, the great wheel which many of us see in the sky today is not so much a wheel as one may think in such terms, but rather a plane made like a wheel. The like of this wheel, like plane, was never seen before. You cannot build one like it and get the same results. Your brains are limited. If you would make one to look like it, you could not get it off the earth into outer space. This mother plane is out there waiting. It's waiting to rapture up the black race right before it sends smaller planes out to destroy the earth and white people. Uh, By the way, that ought to sound familiar to you. Maybe like a movie? Maybe like the movie Independence Day? In fact, the Nation of Islam sued the movie Independence Day for $40 million dollars saying that they stole the plot from the movie from the Nation of Islam's beliefs about the end of the age. Prior to this worldwide destruction, black people will be given one final opportunity to escape. If they do, they'll spend a thousand years on the mother plane until earth is remade and the world begins again with the original man, the black man. Then comes the hereafter. What's the hereafter? Describe the hereafter as an Islamic world of righteousness and happiness forever in the presence of Allah. The NOI hereafter is also said to be a place of complete peace, harmony, and well-being. Critique. This is fantastic. Purely fantastic. You can see that it's a hodgepodge of things that they've taken from uh, prophetic books in the Old Testament from Revelation. They talk about Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel, a thousand years that you're on the mother plane, so on and so forth. All of these things are absolutely fantastic. The average of this movement at its inception had only a fourth grade education. That would seem to explain the acceptance of such fantastic doctrines. Yet these doctrines remain at the core of the movement today. There are at least two possible explanations. First, the theology of the movement could simply be hidden from observers and participants alike. A second possibility is that the socio-political or nationalistic aspects of the movement relegate the theology to a superficial role. The latter is the strongest argument. Therefore, any attempt to evangelize members of the Nation of Islam must not only understand that the movement's theology is distinct from that of Orthodox Islam, it must also account for the socio-political issues that form its foundation. Again, six black pastors, right here in Houston, two of them in seminary with me. One, the most prominent pastor in Houston's Southern Baptist life. 
they stand shoulder to shoulder with the head of this group, promoting the Million Man March, which was a day of atonement. Nobody said anything. They didn't have mass exodus of members from their churches. They weren't scolded or reprimanded by their counterparts and their denominations. Their white brethren decided not to say a word about it to them. Choosing instead to assume it's a black thing. We just must not be able to understand. Folks, this is not hard to understand. These people are lost. Not only are these people lost, these people are deceptive. They are intentionally deceptive. And their deception has a goal behind it. And the goal behind it is that they would reach into the black church community and win converts. That they would be close enough to sound familiar, but distinctive enough to offer an alternative. That they would major on socio-political issues. That they would major on the divide between black and white. And that they would do so in such a way that black people who were Christians would feel a tug in themselves between their Christianity and their blackness. And that in many instances, they would put their Christianity aside and respond with their blackness. And that's what happened 18 years ago this week in Washington, D.C., as hundreds of thousands of black men walked on Washington, marched on Washington. Most of those men were not members of the Nation of Islam. So here's the question that we raise. I mean, this is, this is obvious. This is easy. We understand that this is cultic. It's, it's, it's nonsense. But here's the question. What is it that has so divided us that black Christians are willing to ignore this and align at times with the nation of Islam and white Christians are willing to ignore that response for fear of being judged racist. This is not a problem of theological distinction. This is a problem of sin and division in the camp. This is a problem of sin of Christians who happen to be black, who are willing to put their blackness before their savedness. This is a sin of Christians who happen to be white, who put their fear of being called racist above their desire to call for truth among those who claim to be fellow Christians. This is also about our ignorance. We've been played. <laughs> These people put on garb that often looks sort of Muslim. They look more like Shriners most of the time, but again, they call themselves Muslims and they, the name of it is the Nation of Islam. And so we go, okay, they're Islamic. And they, when they pray, they look like they're you know, Islamic and they greet each other with assalamu alaikum. And you know, that, that, you know, they, they, that's you know, Arabic sounding and there's you know, all this sort of stuff. And then, okay, that's great. So they're, they're, they're this, this Islamic group, but I don't understand this particular Islamic sect. You know now that that's not what it is. We all know now that that's not what it is. And here's my prayer. That because we all know now what it is, that the next time 
half a dozen black pastors line up at a press conference, standing shoulder to shoulder with these people, that the Christians in their churches would have none of it. And that their fellow Christians who happen to be of other ethnicities will call them on it and have absolutely none of it. But there's a price to pay. Here's the question. Okay, you were there, you're in seminary with these guys. How come you didn't say anything? Uh, I did. Y'all know me well enough to know. I did. Here's the response I got. You've been with these white folks too long. That's the response I got. You've been with these white folks too long. Because in their minds, there were some things that transcended their theological convictions. Chief among them, their ethnic heritage. God help us, for in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, nor free, no male, no female, no black, no white. We're all one in Christ. And if we're all one in Christ, then we all have a very simple and unified answer to stuff that sounds like this. And that answer is, that dog won't hunt. It's a simple no. It's a direct no. It's a no that says people who are united with this need to be gospelized. It's a no that says people who have a willingness to compromise and be a part of this, have some severe deficiencies in their understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Pastors who are willing to unite with these people on something called a day of atonement are blasphemers. And there's no other way to look at it. This is a movement that most people don't know much about. They go under the radar until a couple of times a year when they make certain pronouncements. But make no mistake about it. It's a movement to be reckoned with. My prayer for us is that we'd open our eyes to it, that we'd help others open their eyes to it, and that just as we've heard about dealing with Orthodox Islam, that we would press the claims of Christ and the gospel because ultimately that's what these and all other people need. I'm going to take five minutes to answer questions because I'm not going to be up here again to talk about this. And when we have our other Q&A, we're going to be talking about other stuff that Dr. White's teaching us on. Do you have a question or two about this before we go? The question is, did that book actually come yet? The answer is no. No, that that book didn't actually come. Um, Wallace Farr disappeared mysteriously in 1934. It's believed that he was assassinated, kind of like Malcolm X was assassinated by other members of the Nation of Islam. Again, Malcolm X becomes an Orthodox Muslim, and before too long, he's assassinated in a very brutal, very public assassination by a paramilitary group called the Fruit of Islam. Um, They're the enforcers in the nation of Islam, and they're the ones who killed him. Um, So no, no book came from from far. There has been no book, and and we're still stuck with the same thing. As far as a doctrinal statement, um, um, you know, you can can look them up online, um, NOI.org, and look up their beliefs. Um, And you can do a search for what the Muslims believe and what the Muslims want. You can get a copy of their paper and look at the back of their paper 
and just read it and shake your head. Um, but it, it's there. The doctrinal statements uh, are there. Yes. Do these six pastors, do they still hold true to their response or to their brother or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. See, th- this is not uncommon in quote unquote black church circles. Um, there's this affinity with the Nation of Islam, with Minister Farrakhan, um, b- because he says things that from a, from a purely socioeconomic perspective, um, you, you, can, you can hear him talk about things and about, you know, men being responsible and, you know, and taking care of your family and, you know, and not drinking and not, you know, like you, you hear that kind of stuff and you go, yeah, you know, and things happen and he'll stand up and, you know, and, and, and speak against him or whatever. So there's this sort of, this sort of affinity, you know, for him. And he's kind of a, 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 a father figure in many parts of the black community. But that's because he's not talking about this stuff. And people just kind of ignore, ignore that stuff. Um, so, yeah. A- afterwards, you can go look up um, uh, Freddie Haynes in Dallas. Freddie Haynes pastors a huge church in Dallas. Freddie Haynes had a sermon. That next Sunday, after the Million Man March, he dedicated his time in the pulpit to, um, he, he called it a message from the march, and basically communicating to his people the word from God that Minister Farrakhan had at the Million Man March. And Freddie Haynes is still pastoring a church in Dallas, and it's bigger than it's ever been. You know, right there on I-20, big, giant church. Have we passed the time yet? The question is, have we passed that time when supposedly the reign of the white devil was supposed to be over? It was supposed to end in 1987. So, yeah, we a little late, man. Y'all need to be scared. Who are some of the people that fund them? Um, that's a great question. Um, they are, they are the, the, the wealthiest, quote, black organization in the United States. Um, they're in Chicago now. They're based in Chicago. Um, and they have, they have massive wealth. Um, some of the people who fund them are Muslims from the Middle East. Uh, for example, I mean, several years ago, um, there, was, there was one very prominent uh, leader in an Arab nation um, that was a, a known, you know, n- not a friend to the U.S., who gave a million dollars, you know, which was nothing for him. It was oil money, you know, a million dollars to the Nation of Islam. But there are people, you know, who, who are, you know, who, who are funding them from there. Uh, the, the big thing that was happening then, here, here's a big controversy that came up. Um, slavery. Um, you know, th- there are as many, if not more, slaves in the world today than there have ever been. Most of them in North Africa. Um, many of them, um, you know, enslaved uh, Christians in predominantly uh, Islamic countries, um, Sudan and Mauritania, um, huge slave trade, uh, you know, forced slavery there. And there was a big article that came out about slavery and the slave trade. Folks went to the Nation of Islam saying, okay, if anybody is going to condemn this and speak on this and bring this to light, it would be Louis Farrakhan. Um, because of some of the folks who were lying in his pocket, uh, he said nothing. He couldn't. There are a lot of people who support him. Is there a connection between the call for reparation and the wanting to have a black state? What do, what do you mean by the call for reparation? Oh, just kind of the general reparation movement? Um, yes and no. Um, that, not, not necessarily so. But the, the Nation of Islam has been calling for reparations for a long time. Uh, there are other people completely unrelated, you know, who have called for reparations uh, from slavery and things of like that. But no, they're not, they're not necessarily connected. And they're definitely not connected to the idea of, of statehood and having a separate, a separate state. Yeah. Um, two things. Is, does Nation of Islam go by other names? Oftentimes they're referred to as black Muslims. Um, Generally, it's either Nation of Islam or black Muslims. Um, the black Israelites would be a different group, but they would come kind of from the same stream. Um, a 
again, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff behind why, why this thing started in Detroit in that particular period of time, um, you know, the time during the Depression, and um, there are a lot of other black nationalist movements. Um, so yeah, they, they would come from the same stream, but they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be the same, the same movement. Yeah. Well, isn't that a big question? You know, what can we do to enlighten people and enlighten churches that dwell in that ignorance? Um, yeah. Here, here's the thing. Take care of your circle. Take care of your sphere of influence. Take, take care of the opportunities that God gives to you. And if God broadens that sphere of influence, then you take care of that. But just worry about your circle, you know? And to the degree that he gives you influence and he gives you opportunity, uh, you can share these things. That may lead to more influence, more opportunity to share these things. It's the same with anything else. You just, you worry about your, you worry about the circle that he's given you, you know? Because people aren't, generally aren't too keen on hearing from folks who just kind of parade in saying, hey, you need to know this, <laughs> you know? It's just, <laughs> yes, one more. Yeah, good question. Um, outside of places like, you know, Chicago, New York, Detroit, um, is this really a major issue? Uh, it's, a ma it's definitely a major city issue. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue where there are dense urban populations. Um, it's an issue within our prison system. It's a huge issue within our prison system throughout the country. Um, so yeah, it, it is. It is an issue, and it, and it, and it is a, a pervasive one. Although it's kind of demographic in nature, obviously. You know, um, the other question about Louis Farrakhan. He's old. He has prostate can He had prostate cancer. He's been. I don't know if he's been treated for for that. If he's you know remission cure or whatever. But he he's he's up there now. Um, you know what happens when he's gone. A lot of people ask the same thing about Elijah Muhammad. Here's Elijah Muhammad. Nobody knew Louis Farrakhan, you know? Who was that? And then Elijah Muhammad's gone. You know, a son of his takes one group one way. Louis Farrakhan, who was head of the fruit of Islam, um, you know, goes in another direction. He, he, becomes, he becomes the guy. Um, they've got a lot of resources, you know? And organizations with a lot of resources tend to have somebody pick it up and move it on. Um, and there are a lot of other groups out there that are very close and very similar. Um, you know, these ideas, that the new Black Panther movement and things like that. You know, the guy Quan LX here in Houston. He used to be, you know, Nathan Islam guy. Now he's a new Black Panther, you know, guy or whatever. Um, you know, there, there, there are tons of streams out there that are very much connected to this. And it's not going anywhere because it, it, it has a lot of traction with people, unfortunately. So I don't think that Louis Farrakhan's passing will, will, will mean the end of the nation of Islam. 